Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. It's good to have you here today. Why don't we stand to our feet as we begin and open up this celebration of life in worship, the appropriate way. We'll invite you to sing your hearts out today. Is that okay? So when we sing, everybody sings. And let's just lift up a, a praise to God that's worthy of his name today. Amen. The splendor of the King.
You're good. You may be seated this morning. Well, first of all, just welcome today. It's just a, a privilege, and we're so glad that you're here with us. So family and friends, we just welcome you. We are here today to celebrate the life of Bonnie Ruth Soller. And uh, when I think of her, she's the wife, the mom, the sister, the friend, the woman of God, a superhero in my mind, <laughs> and I could go on. So we do, we just, we really want to thank everyone for being here today, especially uh, if you traveled a long ways, we just want to say a special thank you for being here with us. We really, really do appreciate it. And, uh, you know, being surrounded by love both today and over these last couple months has made the journey a lot easier. And so I want to just thank, say thank you on behalf of our family We've been blessed because we've had so many caring about us and walking this journey with us. And so thank you today. We want to honor Bonnie today. Yes, our hearts can be heavy, but we still want to celebrate her. And uh, she was an amazing woman who ran her race well. She finished her assignment, and she is now with the Lord. And just as scripture says, we don't grieve as people who don't have hope but actually the very opposite. We today have great hope, a great hope. And we, we trust what God says in his word. We trust the words of Jesus. And we know that Bonnie is in her great reward. There's no more sickness. There's no, no more suffering. You know, I know right now she's with her mom and her dad. She's with her brother, Bob. And she's with all that have gone on ahead of us. And as it says in God's word, she is now part of the great cloud of witnesses that is cheering us on. And so that's the atmosphere that we want today because we want to celebrate her. And we, we do, we just thank you today for being part of that. So let's celebrate together, amen? Thank you, Pastor. My delight to be here today. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 9 and 9. Hebrews 11.6, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Bonnie, Ruth Soller Raymer was a person who habitually sought after God. If something or someone's situation seemed impossible, she, she would seek the face of God until she was certain what God wanted. In church meetings, she ministered to the many, but was always open for the Lord to lead her to that one individual that needed a touch from God. Only eternity will reveal the number of people that she led into the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You see, Bonnie was a Holy Spirit-filled woman, saved, gave her life to Jesus at age five, and was baptized with the Holy Spirit at age seven. Bonnie valued the friendship and close relationship with her brothers, Don, Bob, Dave, and John, and their families. She loved all of you. And then she met us, the Art Soller family. And that is another story of adventure from coast to coast. She loved and cared for us dearly, and that's what we will miss the most. Bonnie's missionary journeys would have made interesting reading, but now they are stored in the memory of those 
who heard her share the events as if they happened just yesterday. When Bonnie spoke, people listened and lives were changed. There are so many people here in Canada, many watching today by live stream, those overseas whose lives were touched by her hand and her voice. She being gone from us for a while continues to speak today. You will hear about Bonnie from family members friends and colleagues in ministry. But I'm sure that if she was with us now, she would want us to talk much about her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May he be lifted up today as we sing the songs of faith and praise that Bonnie loves so much. And then I would say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I played many songs for Bonnie and we were in the hospital for three months. All the old songs, but one day she said, Art, play me some modern worship music. <laughs> well, we have some of the old and we have some of the new. Pastor John, her brother, coming. God bless you. God bless the congregation. Good morning. Our scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 to 8. And I'll read from the message. For we know that when these bodies of ours are taken down like tents and folded away, they will be replaced by resurrection bodies in heaven. God made not handmade. And we'll never have to relocate our tents again. Sometimes we can hardly wait to move. And so we cry out in frustration. Compared to what's coming, living conditions here seem like a stopover in an unfinished shack. And we're tired of it. We've been given a glimpse of the real thing, our true home, our resurrection bodies. The Spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. He puts a little of heaven in our hearts so that we will never settle for less. That's why we live with such good cheer. You won't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. Cramped conditions here don't get us down. They only remind us of the spacious living conditions ahead. It's what we trust in, but don't yet see that keeps us going. Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us. When the time comes, we'll be plenty ready to exchange exile for homecoming. To be absent from the body is to be present. Present with the Lord. Bonnie's with the Lord. As the young brother, the one that Bonnie was a second mother to, she was a worshiper. And let me say, she is a worshiper now. She's with the Lord. Let's give thanks. Father, yes, Lord, we do give you thanks and we praise you because this is the hope we have. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity to celebrate the life of your daughter, Bonnie Ruth. And we do, and we remember, and we recall, and we know that we'll be reunited. Father, we pray for strength for the Soller family, strength for 
the Raymer family and all the friends and the many whose lives have been touched by Bonnie. We thank you for comfort. We thank you for hope. We thank you for faith. We thank you for your love. And today we celebrate in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your up in this place right now with our hands and our voices. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. At Bob's funeral, the casket was here. 
and I was able to lean on him to get up to the platform. Thank you for my younger brother this morning. <laughs> We're here to remember Bonnie Ruth Raymer. My first remembrance of Bonnie is uh, we were living in New Glasgow. Uh, Bonnie was coming and uh, mother went back to Truro and gave birth to Bonnie at the Annex Hospital there. And my first remembrance of Bonnie is being taken by dad, Bob and I, back to Truro and uh, standing out on the front lawn, looking up to the window and seeing mother holding a baby sister. <laughs> As for a four-year-old and a two-year-old, we wondered how this was going to mess up our life. <laughs> a sister. But as time went on, it really didn't make that much change. We boys still got the hand-me-downs from kids in the church, and Bonnie got the new frilly dresses <laughs> that were made by Jean McLean. Some would know Jean McLean in New Glasgow, and uh, Bonnie was the lucky one to be, have her doing that for her. As a family, we moved to St. John, New Brunswick, and in 1957, Dad pioneered the church, Bethany Temple. Interesting enough, just a few weeks ago, uh, something came out in the St. John paper, a picture of the opening of the Bethany Temple in 1957, and about 120 people standing out in the front of the church, and the picture was taken. And if you have seen that picture, you'll see Bonnie standing third row in on her tiptoes, trying to see over her two brothers uh, in that picture, St. John, New Brunswick. As a young person, Bonnie picked up mom's passion. Mom's passion was music, and her, pa her passion was worship. And Bonnie learned how to do both. And no matter when she came to visit us or whenever we were together, there were always times of singing and together and worshiping as we would gather around the, pro the piano. I, I don't remember that much about Bonnie's teenage years. Uh, I have in my notes here, Bob and I had already received our luggage for Christmas. <laughs> and so we had gone to Ontario. It was sort of a family joke when we would show Christmas pictures and there would be luggage under the tree we would say to mother, who turned 18 that year? Because <laughs> we would head, Bob and I headed here to Ontario to study, and Bonnie stayed home. I'm sure mother didn't have to stay up late hours at night praying for her daughter, as she seemed to think she had to do for her boys. But thank the Lord for those prayers, especially this one beside me. He always refers to himself as the black sheep, but we're grateful that the black sheep has come home and is with us today. Bonnie followed the Raymer tradition in Truro. We all worked for Dominion Stores Limited in different aspects of the grocery business, and she followed right along. She prepared for her love of teaching. Interesting in Truro, she went to normal school. We always thought that was sort of funny that it was called normal school, but that's what they called the teacher's training back in those days. And she became a teacher, her career that literally led her around the world. It's interesting, they re refer to us in the, in the Raymer family as being a close-knit family. Well, we might have been in spirit, but we sure weren't physically. When uh, we were in Thailand uh, for those number of years, Bob and Marilyn, they were in Papua New Guinea and Kenya and Hong Kong. David was in Frobisher Bay, Alaska, and has settled now in Mekong, Georgia. John pastored several churches throughout Canada, and uh, most recently he just got back from Watoto in Uganda. But Bonnie wasn't to be outdone. Bonnie 
taught school in Truro area. She taught school in Frobers Bay in Alberta and, and uh, British Columbia. Started a Harambe school. Some of you have been there in Kenya when she was there. And then also she spent time with us in Thailand. And in Thailand, she started an elementary school for the MKs that were there. Uh, the Schellenberg kids, the young kids, the Markhams, and uh, the Windsors. I don't know if the Faulkner kids got in on that school or not, but she was their Auntie Bonnie for the missionary kids in Thailand. Bonnie was also living with us in Bangkok when we uh, went to the little Seventh-day Adventist orphanage to pick up our seven-month-old adopted daughter. She was known as Suppaporn there. She doesn't even know that name herself now. But she became our chosen daughter, Rasami Dawn. And Rasami Dawn is here today as she and her husband are now living between Ottawa and Tampa. Bonnie and Rasami developed a, a very special relationship throughout those years. Auntie Bonnie's will always be close to her heart as to all of our kids. Then came 1987. It changed all of our lives. All of a sudden, at Camp Evangeline at our cottage, this pastor chart started showing up on our doorstep all the time. And it seemed to get more often uh, as it went on. And then later on that summer at camp, uh, Bonnie got flowers. Art, what were you doing? Got flowers and... and uh, some other nice things started showing up. We enjoyed the candy. Anyway, <laughs> poor Dorothy, she stood up. She stayed up every night to late, late at night, waiting for Bonnie to come in to find out what was the latest. <laughs> what was the latest? <laughs> Did you get your first kiss? <laughs> to us brothers, that was no big deal. We had a lot of first kisses at camp. But Bonnie had fallen in love. It was a little later that fall, Art popped the question, and we were all summoned back to Truro for a wedding in 1987, almost 30 years, Art, a long time ago. From the very beginning, it was very evident that Art and Bonnie had a special relationship. They had a love for God, they had a love for the, his work, and they had a love for, her, for each other. And they were remarkable. What a day that was when we started working and walking alongside the Soller family. In fact, the Soller family, every time we would go back to camp, we always look forward to the Soller reunion because on that day, we had a, the best feed of steamed lobsters and mussels and all the trimmings. Art, don't forget us if you get back there. <laughs> David and Janice and Tony, thank you for accepting our sister as your friend and your mother. You have treated her well. Thank you, Art, for your enduring love and care for her, and we honor you for your commitment to our sister. You are welcome to our table anytime, whether it be here or down in Lake Lim, Florida. Come to Lake Lim, Florida, you'll enjoy that. Just imagine, as John has already referred to, the celebration that's going on right now with Bonnie, and Bob and Mother all playing their instruments and Dad trying to sing Telephone of Glory. <laughs> that was not his gifting music. But imagine the celebration that's going on. Of the Raymer family, there are 33 cousins. Five of us have now gone on to be with the Lord. And my last admonition to any cousins that might be here, let's not forget our heritage. We're going home someday. God bless you, each one.
Good morning. Um, my name is Suzanne, and I'm a niece of Aunt Bonnie's and a daughter of the guy standing here <laughs> beside Uncle Don. Um, so today, I just want to share with you a very small memory. Uh, as a child, my earliest memories of Bonnie are those that Grammy Raymer shared. She spoke endearing of words of her and called her my Bonnie. Now that I think of it, that grammatical determiner, uh, uh, determiner word, my, was rather possessive, don't you think? Instead of saying something like, our Bonnie, for representing her and Grampy, it was always my Bonnie. Maybe it was because Bonnie had a special reservation in her Grammy's heart, in my Grammy's heart, her mom's heart. From the stories, I remember Grammy Raymer sharing of my Aunt Bonnie. It appeared that she could do no wrong. Yet some of the stories my Aunt Bonnie would share with me about her years of reign over her brothers made me understand that she wasn't as angelic as she always made out to by Grammy. <laughs> uh, then again, you know, being the eldest child myself, I can empathize with Aunt Bonnie, the desire to have a little fun at her brother's expenses. Sorry, you guys. My Aunt Bonnie, however, had a tender heart of gold the kind of refined love that only Jesus could give. In my life, Aunt Bonnie showed her care in several, where, in several ways. She had endearing words for me always. It seemed like she always had the right words. And she spoke of God's words of comfort in my hardships. Uh, her journey of faith and her testimony of how good God was always helped me persevere. And I'm sure she did for many others. In reflection, I also realized that Aunt Bonnie was somehow miraculously present in many of the significant events of my life, even though we were so distant. And uh, that was especially when I was a young mom and an early um, wife. She was present the day I got married. She was present at the hospital when I underwent major surgery. She was present when I said goodbye to my brother after he was liberated from a wheelchair, ALS, and went to be with Jesus with dancing shoes. Um, she was present the day my daughter was born. She was present when my husband and I were making a difficult transition in ministry. She and Uncle Art were the first to welcome us to Eastern Canada after a long, arduous move from the West. She was there to anoint me with oil. I will never know the sacrifices she potentially made to be present in those moments because Aunt Bonnie always said it was a privilege for her to be there with me. That tender heart of gold was her motivation. So today, as an expression of my own endearing love for Aunt Bonnie, I say in celebration of her life that she will always be my Bonnie. I suspect that many of you will say likewise, for Bonnie loved deeply and was loved in return. Thank you, Uncle Art and the rest of the family for allowing me to reflect, to write this little moment. And um, it was truly a privilege and a very unexpected gift. Thank you. I'm, I'm Carrie Raymer. I'm Bob's daughter. And Art had asked me um, to kind of take, take some words and stories from several of our cousins and, and put them together and share on behalf of um, the the 10 of us who grew up with our Auntie Bonnie in our lives. Um, when we were little, for the 10 of us nieces and nephews, Auntie Bonnie was one of those fun aunties. Most of our memories of her are from our childhood because back then she was free to be a fun auntie and she could swoop in. Um, she didn't have a family of her own at that point, so she was free to come and go and be fun auntie when our, our parents went away, leaving her in charge. Once you have a family of your own, it's pretty hard to be fun auntie because you're just busy and you're tired. <laughs> I learned that the same way that Auntie Bonnie did. Um, but for her nieces and her nephews, most of our memories then are from long ago when we had her to ourselves. Those memories are of trips to the fair and riding the full roller coasters. There are memories of sleepovers and root beer floats and water fights in the backyard. Letters and phone calls full of wise advice and special occasions with Auntie Bonnie there. As a very young child, I lived with my parents in Kenya, but was lucky enough to have Auntie Bonnie nearby some of that time. Auntie Bonnie was also there in Thailand, um, as Uncle Don said, when Don and Dorothy brought Rasami home from the orphanage. <laughs> Tara credits Auntie Bonnie with teaching her how to speak properly instead of grunting. So Tara um, was left 
with Auntie Bonnie, and Auntie Bonnie was not going to put up with, with the grunting. <laughs> and so, so that was what happened over one weekend when Bonnie was in charge of caring for Tara. Um, her parents were amazed to discover they no longer had a grunter on their hands when they returned home from their, from their trip, and Bonnie had taught her to use her words properly. <laughs> Um, one summer when I was about 12, my parents asked Auntie Bonnie to look after me while they were on a trip to Europe. I don't even know if they know this story, but um, I was left in her care in Nova Scotia after the family trip to the Maritimes, and after a couple of weeks of time at Camp Evangeline and visits with Grampy and Grammy at the family cottage, it was time for our road trip back to Ontario. Now, those of you who have traveled with Bonnie will know that there's not a lot of chit-chat along the way. <laughs> But she had cool Christian rock cassette tapes. <laughs> this was the 80s. <laughs> and I got to sit in the front seat for once, so I was pretty pleased with how things were going. I remember we stopped for the night in Quebec to camp, and it was an unseasonably cold evening. I mean, it was cold. We were cuddled up in the tent, shivering with every scrap of clothing we could muster, and I began to state the obvious, whimpering that I was freezing to death. Auntie Bonnie sat up, and she shone the flashlight, on her own face and she said, look, in any situation like this, we can choose to cry or we can choose to laugh. And tonight we are going to laugh. And we did, and I've never forgotten that little lesson. Um, and anyone who's ever heard Bonnie's laugh will say also, you don't forget that either. <laughs> her laugh was contagious and memorable. Bonnie was always on the move, living in interesting places and doing interesting and impactful things. She swooped in for big events, but for most of us, for most of our lives, because of geography, she was someone we heard about rather than someone we spent time with. When I was younger, I always admired how she lived her life as a single woman. I would hear stories about how she went out and she made a difference. And later, I would come to admire how she adapted to married life and immediately set about loving on her new instant family with such commitment. She couldn't be fun auntie anymore. She was busy with her own family. But her life continued to be an example of, of love, um, of service, and one to follow. We were all so proud when she and Uncle Art went to the unreached people of Eskasoni in Cape Breton to do something no one else was doing. Um, as a teacher, I really appreciated the work that she was doing there. Her love for and commitment to her Aboriginal friends was amazing. Their home was the gateway to the reserve there, and she worked tirelessly to build relationships and build capacity in people through literacy training and through ministry. She was faithful and tenacious and unbelievably unstoppable. As Ryan puts it, she spurred us on to believe by faith, for God to do what others think is unbelievable, and then to hold on to him and thereby become unstoppable. Even when she was battling at the end, she was unstoppable in singing her praises to God. And now she's singing praises to the king face to face. I saw Bonnie twice in the last few months of her illness. The first time it was on the iPad. <laughs> Both she and my dad, her older brother Bob, were too ill to visit each other, and so Art and I arranged for a call for them on FaceTime, where they were able to look into each other's eyes, encourage one another, and say their goodbyes. It was sad, but it was good, and it wasn't so much goodbye as it was see you soon. After my dad passed away, Mom and I went to visit Bonnie in the hospital just as she was being moved into palliative care. She was able to talk to us and listen as we told her about Dad's passing. And we wanted her to know that he was gone, that he hadn't been afraid to go, and that he had looked forward to seeing his mom and dad again, and that she, when the time would come, would join them and their savior, and there was nothing to fear about that. I'm so grateful now that she's no longer suffering, and she's singing in God's presence. Our Auntie Bonnie was an incredible woman of God and a wonderful aunt who poured her humor and faith into our lives. She was a true role model, she was full of Jesus, gave sacrificially of herself, and loved unconditionally. As Tara says, she always reminded her of Deborah in the Bible, wise, but ready to put her hand to the plow. That was our Auntie Bonnie. She was loved and admired, and she'll be missed. Why don't we stand? We're going to sing another song. I know it's already been mentioned, but uh, my mom loved uh, to worship God. It was one of her mainstays. It, uh, you know, when I when I think it just transcended 
Yeah, she was never one of these people. I knew she knew every old hymn, but she also knew every new song. Somehow she had it in her heart. She'd bridge that gap. And uh, as a young person, that always spoke to me. And, you know, so today, let's just worship. Let's lift up his name because he's worthy of praise and he's worthy of honor and worthy of glory. And so, Lord, we exalt you. We praise your name, Jesus. We praise your name. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I once was lost, but was blind, but now I see. And t'was grace, t'was grace that brought my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. And how precious did that I first believed that my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, Amazing grace, and the Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures, and He will my shield and portion me as long. As a life in those and my chains and my chains are gone and I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and a like of blood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace let's sing that one more time and my chains are gone and I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and a like of blood his mercy reigns on living love
favorite part. I live to worship you. Oh, yes, we do, Lord. I live to worship you. Come on, lift your voice like a choir today. Oh, you were comfortable, why don't you lift up your hands in this place today? Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Oh, we worship you, Lord. You are worthy, God. Oh, you are worthy. You may be seated. Hi. <laughs> I'm Rachel. I'm Bonnie Sollers, oldest granddaughter. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of all of her grandchildren. Matthew, Jordan, Amanda, Lauren, Jaden, and Judah. All of us agree that our biggest memories with our nanny are based around Camp Evangeline's A1 cabin. 
I can remember those summers of Nanny and Poppy picking us up from the airport and driving us down the dirt road. Leaves would be dancing in the wind and smell of fresh dew in the air with the promise of another summer together. Nanny and Poppy never let us be bored because they always knew how to have fun. We all shared memories of playing phase 10 on rainy afternoons in the cabin or going to the movie theaters or building boats for the annual river race. One special thing that Nanny always did was save change all year for us to spend at the tuck shop. She called it the nanny jar. Now, if you know my nanny, you know that she's a teacher. When I was younger, I was diagnosed with dyslexia and I couldn't do the one thing that I wanted to do the most, uh, and that was to read. For me, books were an adventure into other worlds and I just wanted to go there. And I remember spending afternoons with my nanny practicing vocabulary and spelling. It was such a wonderful experience to have someone take the time to believe in you and uh, to help me find those new places. Nanny was a teacher among, um, of many things, but for me, she helped me learn to read. Now, on the day my nanny passed, I remember I spent a lot of time that morning in my bed thinking, what to do next? What's the next step? Um, my sister and I had spent a lot of time at the hospital with my poppy that week, and it was really hard to see her in pain. Um, but I'm really happy she's not anymore. So I walked outside, and it was a spring morning. Um, and there, below my feet, was the first flower of spring. It was a little yellow flower. Uh, there's a quote by Suzanne Collins that I think describes this moment the best for me. I'm going to read it to you. What I need is the dandelion in the spring, the promise that life can go on, no matter how bad our loss is, that it can be good again. Poppy? Poppy. <laughs> I framed that same flower for you. That way you can remember, never forget that she will never truly be gone, never truly forgotten, I think she put that little yellow flower in my path to remind us all that life will be good again and that she'll be cheering us on. Thank you. Those closest to Bonnie knew that her last year and months were hard. And Bonnie had mild cognitive impairment and sometimes forgot things she did just moments before. Not long ago, she woke up at the hospital not knowing how she got there. And we remembered how sick she was, how confused she seemed, and how loud she was, um, and how she didn't want to be there the day before, but she didn't remember that. So the next day when I arrived, she seemed chipper. She says, I don't remember getting here. I said, no. And that person next to me is being so noisy. They need to be quiet. I said, that's payback, sweetie. That was you yesterday. <laughs> it was? Yes. <laughs> I started to wonder if one day Bonnie would wake up in heaven and be surprised she was there. <laughs> and so I said to Dad, I think we need to talk to Bonnie about heaven. And we were just waiting for the right moment to have that conversation. So on March 24th, one of the first warm days of spring, I looked it up, it was 17 degrees, but that felt really warm for March. We took her outside. She said, I'm cold. I don't want to stay out here. Anybody who knows Bonnie knows for the last four years she's been cold everywhere. She came to church and put a poncho or any blanket around her so she'd stay warm. So we took her inside and we went to the little chapel at Dravinsky. And we read some scripture. And then I said, Bonnie, why don't you pray? And she was getting tired, I could tell. And it didn't take much to wear her out. And she said, no, why don't you pray, Art? And I said, Bonnie, I think you should pray. And she said, okay. She closed her eyes, and in the strongest, deepest, 
familiar, Holy Spirit-filled prayer. She said, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. I don't remember the rest of the prayer. All I remember is that I looked over at Dad, and he was crying, and I was crying. And then we talked about heaven. And I said, Bonnie, you're not going to heaven today, but I think you're going to get there before us. And when you do, you will see your mom and dad and your brother Bob. She then looked at me with a start, because every few days she forgot Bob had died. And each time we told her, she was sad again. I don't know what, me, what made me say the next thing, but for some reason I said, can I ask you to do something for me when you get to heaven? And she said, yes. I said, will you find my mom, Doreen, and would you tell her about us, about our kids? <laughs> Rachel said, that's where you're going to cry. <laughs> about our kids and our grandkids, and what a wonderful life we've all had together. And she said, I will, Jan. I loved when she said, Jan. This was just one of the hundreds of memories I could have shared with you today. And when I was 18, my mom died, and God blessed our family with Bonnie. And I say without hesitation that Bonnie became as much a part of us, the Soller family, as our mom had been. And when mom passed, it felt like a crack in our universe. And today, it feels like the end of another era. And although our days go past hers and many things to still do and experience, today I miss the woman, Bonnie, who was fun and strong and smart. Two more lines. <laughs> I will miss our Saturday breakfast. I will miss our Scrabble games. I will miss her sticking up for me and saying, Art, stay out of it. <laughs> she said that, right? <laughs> and I will miss my friend and our second mom. As uh, we were just uh, away, just uh, with the missions team over uh, Mother's Day, and I was just reading through uh, all kinds of things people say at Mother's Day, and um, Bonnie did adopt us probably at a rough time. I was thinking back at that. We were teenagers. Some say not the best teenagers. I don't think we were really bad. We were just not medicated properly at the time. <laughs> proper drugs, we would have been fine. And, uh, and, and one of the scriptures, a common one that people say at Mother's Day is that her children rise up and call her, call her blessed. And um, so Bonnie really did live through some of her good years and some of her bad years. And, um, but they were really all good, but adopted us just the same. Became part of the family. And uh, I guess Bonnie never had her own physical kids, but she actually had all kinds of kids. She had us, and then I was thinking back over the past uh, decades that, that I knew Bonnie, and even here from her family here, about even the time before that, that this is one of the amazing things that we have. People wonder, why are we people of faith? Is that we have the ability to have many spiritual kids, and that's what Bonnie had, all over the world. In Cape Breton, we sing a song. We sing lots of songs in Cape Breton. I didn't bring a fiddle with me or anything like that. But we sing the, this song, and I actually have never sung it, but it's sung a lot in Cape Breton, is that we'll rise again in the faces of our children. And that's so true. And the truth is today, in the past, and in the future, this side of heaven and on the other side, a whole group of people, a whole group of children will rise up and call Bonnie blessed.
truly my honor to be here at this beautiful and truly spiritual gathering of the people of God. Amen? It's great to sense the Spirit of the Lord on a Tuesday. It is Tuesday or it's Wednesday. Got to get up to speed here. It's good to feel them on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Monday, Saturday is good as well, especially Sunday, right, pastors? That's always good. Let's get to it. It's my honor today to represent the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, both its national office and the District of Western Ontario. So on behalf to, uh, today of Pastor David Wells and his wife Susan, who is here today, thanks Sue for being here, for Pastor Lori Gibbons and his wife Debbie, who sadly can't be here today, they would love to be here, Art, I'm sure of that. It's my honor to share condolences, greetings, and thanksgiving for the legacy of Bonnie that we're hearing about today. I am honored, honored to do that. That is the theme, I think, that is developing in our gathering today, the legacy that she has left, both seen and unseen, but carefully noted by our Lord Jesus Christ. No doubt about that. Amen? Amen. Pastor Kevin Johnson, Kevin and Anne Marie Johnson, superintendent of the Maritime District of the PAOC, sends the following note. On behalf of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada Maritime District, I want to extend our deepest sympathies to the, to the Soller and Raymer families, and especially to Art. Our hearts were saddened to hear of Bonnie's passing, but we know she is rejoicing today because of the great hope we have in Christ. Bonnie was first credentialed in 1974 and was a special woman of God. Her ministry touched numerous lives, which we've clearly heard about today, whether as a missionary, serving in the local church, or among her Aboriginal friends. I remember sitting in services when she would speak or play the piano or sing. There was an anointing on her life that always drew you into God's presence. She lived a life that was fully given to her Lord and Savior. She was loved and respected and will be missed greatly, and our entire district feels a sense of loss. To all the Soller and Raymer family members, your friends in the Maritime District hold you in our hearts today as you celebrate and remember a champion of our faith who ran the race so well. We pray that you will be comforted by the presence and the peace of our Lord today as you celebrate Bonnie's life. May we all run the race as well as Bonnie did. Now, you don't know this, but I left out one line in the middle of this memo, this note, because I wanted to save it for last. This is Kevin writing now, and he says this. This is Kevin Johnson, the district superintendent in the Maritime. He says this, personally, Bonnie has always held a special place in my life. This is great, Art. As she was the one who led me to faith in Christ as an eight-year-old boy. It doesn't get better than that. Now, there's a legacy. That's great. I'm just guessing it might have been Camp Evangeline. I have no idea, but uh, that's what I, who knows? Who cares? He's a believer, and God used Bonnie to make that happen. I saw Bonnie about two months ago, which was a real delight. Tony was there, and we talked a little bit about Thailand. I really uh, my wife and I and our kids had the for good fortune of spending a bit of time in Thailand, not when Bonnie was there, but we were able to share a few stories. And in her honor today, I feel inclined, led of the Spirit. So if it goes bad, don't blame me, all right? Led of the Spirit to teach you a little bit of Thai. You want to learn a little Thai language? Now, I'm taking the big risk because there's some really good Thai speakers sitting here today. I hope there's no Thai people here. This is going to sound really bad, so forgive me when you hear this. But it's very simple, and I really want you to participate with me, and there's purpose in it. It won't take long. It's three little words that go, Pope, Gun, Mai. Can you say that with me, Pope? Come on, folks, get into it. Pope, Gun, Mai. Now, you have to say it properly. You go a little high on the pope, a little in the middle in the gun, and then a little lower on the mai. If you don't say it with the proper tones, you could be saying anything in this church, and you don't want to do that. <laughs> Let's try it again. Pope, gun, mai. Pope, gun, mai. That's excellent. You know what that means? Simply, roughly translated, until we meet again. And isn't it great that today, never, as brothers and sisters in the fellowship of the Spirit of Christ, we never say goodbye. We always say, and to Bonnie today, Pope Gun Mai, until we meet again. Amen? Amen? God bless you, Art, and your precious family. It's an honor to be able to share with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Today, I am uh, representing Bonnie's friends. Now, she had many friends, and all of us could get together and we'd share a whole lot of stuff, and we might not even recognize between us who we're talking about because we all have different experiences. So there's nothing like the home going of a loved friend to make us realize our own mortality and to realize that heaven is sounding sweeter all the time. So I want to tell you about my friend, Bonnie. Now, we were actually friends before we were Saulers. We were roommates at Bible college. During our second year, three of us roomed together, two nurses and a teacher, and we were the mature students. We had the room inside Blair Hall, just inside the door, so we could see everybody coming and going. And in that room, Bonnie was the organizer. So she organized, had us. You know, a good organizer has people that do things. And she had us organize the room so that we would have lots of room to exercise. Now, we didn't, I can't remember any of the exercising too much, but the room was there. She was really good. And since we were close to the door, there was the occasional young woman who might have been out a little bit longer than the last bell. And so that person would quickly run into our room and say, Sister Adder's patrolling and, you know, can you help me? And uh, after a while, Sister Adder would come in and she would say, I'm looking for so-and-so. Um, if you happen to see her, would you tell her I'm looking for her? And we said, oh, yes, we'd be happy to do that. She was likely hiding behind the carefully arranged desks. There was always fun when Bonnie was around, but we shouldn't all blame it on her, I guess. Um, after coming home one weekend from a college assignment, Bonnie told us that the college instructor with her group had been given sleeping accommodation in a room uh, with the info that the dog liked that room. And he should not be surprised if the dog tried to come in during the night. In the morning, Bonnie realized that the register where she was was directly above the register where he was. And so she called down, Oh, Daniel, ha has your God been able to save you from the mouth of the dogs? <laughs> and so we had a great laugh about that. Bonnie's life exemplifies to me Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Bonnie taught in schools from sea to sea to sea, from Newfoundland to Frobisher Bay, which is now, now a, qual a Qualoit, and to British Columbia, and overseas in Thailand and Kenya, as we've already heard. But in 1987, she took on a major challenge. In one day, she became a wife, a pastor's wife, a, mother's, a mother, and along with that in time, eventually a grandmother. I remember her saying to me, life really does begin at 40. From then on, it was Art and Bonnie. Now, with all Bonnie's travels, I hadn't had a huge amount of contact with her, but a friend is someone you can meet up with after a long time and take up where you left off. And that's how it was with Bonnie. And now that we were all pastoring together in the Maritimes, there was lots of contact, lots of holidays, lots of meals together, lots of trips. On Art and Bonnie's first anniversary, we, Art and Bonnie, and another couple set off for a journey to a reunion at EPBC. Carl and our other friend gallantly offered to carry Art and Bonnie's suitcases. In the process, they dumped a bag of confetti into them. Now, neither Bonnie or Art ever gave us the satisfaction of admitting that they'd even noticed there was any confetti. 
But notice that they did, and they told us years later that they were still digging the stuff out of their suitcases. <laughs> Bonnie was lots of fun, but she told it like it was. She was a great confidence keeper. She never had a bad word to say about anybody, and if, she, if anybody did, she would reprimand them. And she would go out of her way to help anyone but she knew how to let go, understanding that individual responsibility is necessary. She was a mother to many who consider her still that today. When we moved to BC, once again separated by distance, uh, it was just phone calls. But in 1988, we went for a, a visit to Nova Scotia, and Art and Bonnie decided to come back with us. And we had a great, exciting trip flying in a puddle jumper from Cal Calgary to Cranbrook, B.C. Once we got there, we soon discovered we had a couple of spies on our hands. And they were checking out the land and discovered that it was flowing with milk and honey. In August 99, they arrived in Creston, B.C., driving a U-Haul truck. Guess they thought that was safer than the puddle jumper. And there they were, complete with their cats, their car in the back of the truck was uh, filled with Bonnie's plants and all their belongings packed around it. They unloaded it in our garage. And since it was time for pastor's camp in Alberta, we all jumped in the car and went there. The Lord was directing Art and Bonnie's steps. At camp, they met our BC district superintendent who suggested they should consider an appointment to pastor the Native Church in Prince George, B.C. Art being the spur-of-the-moment person he is, and by Bonnie's testimony and Art's admission that she could never organize him, they decided that we should immediately go to Prince George to check things out. Another 10-hour drive. We did, and on arriving at the church, one of the ladies from the church was there conducting a VBS, and she shared with us how they were looking for a pastor. They needed a pastor. And Bonnie said to her, if you can wait just two weeks, we will come and be your pastor. That began years of ministry to the Native people, not only in Prince George, but to outlying reserves, some along some along the road that is known today as the Highway of Tears. I wonder how many women and girls were impacted and transformed through Art and Bonnie's ministry and escaped the fate so many have experienced in that area. We visited reserves with Bonnie and Art all the way along the highway from Prince George to Prince Rupert, praying with people as we went. In Prince George, Art and Bonnie lived in an upstairs apartment on the back of the church. And just outside the kitchen door, Bonnie had a rooftop garden. She was, I can still see her out there in her nightgown, weeding and watering and picking what was ready to eat. She was known to throw cucumbers and tomatoes down to passers-by so they could enjoy. And one day the police drove by and she was quick to tell them she was only growing vegetables. <laughs> to which they replied it was a good thing since she was living in the church. It was a miracle to me that that garden never collapsed into the rented office below. It was a sad day for us when Art and Bonnie moved back to Nova Scotia. But the Lord prepared them for the work he had for them in Eskasoni, Cape Breton. And they must go. So once again, we were back to visit, visiting them in Nova Scotia. And our one great highlight was to help and be with them on their 25th wedding anniversary and see them honored in such an amazing way. They were loved. The same year they moved here to Hamilton, they made one more trip to BC and we made another pilgrimage to Prince George where they were able to renew old acquaintances. Bonnie's health was starting to fail, but she undertook the trip with gusto, and more wonderful memories were made. During her time here in Hamilton, we have watched Bonnie gradually give up the things she loved to do, 
but I can tell you that her spirit remains strong. I remember well one Sunday late, late last summer. It was difficult for her to be in church every Sunday, but when she could, she was here. And this particular Sunday, she was here, and a number of people were at the altar, and I watched Bonnie slowly get up and come over to pray with people here. It was probably the last Sunday that she ever did that. And if you're one of the people that she prayed with, you are blessed. This past week, few weeks we have been difficult watching Bonnie's life here on earth slip away. But who has the right to say our lives on earth here are not valuable to the very end, to the very last breath? As Bonnie lay in her bed, she sang songs of praise to Jesus. I heard her many times softly saying the name of Jesus. I wonder how many caregivers heard the songs of praise and the breaths of prayer she offered to her Jesus and are considering they might need to find out who this Jesus is. On April 25th, we visited Bonnie on our way to the airport for our trip to Israel. We knew she would be in heaven before we got back. It was a sad time for us, but glorious for her. Bonnie Ruth Raymer Soller, you already know what we have yet to experience and can only imagine. Goodbye, dear friend. We'll see you in the morning. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, I'm going to try not to take too long. I, uh, I do have some things to share, and I'm probably going to just start a little bit. I'm going to talk as a son first, and then I'm going to get to the pastoral part at the end, okay? Hope everyone will be good with that. I... Uh, I know it was already mentioned, but I really do want to thank everybody for being here. And uh, I also want to thank, uh, there were just a number of people, a number of ladies that would go and visit our mom a lot. 
in the hospital. And I just want to just say thank you for doing that. And we've had people bring meals. We've, you know, lots of calls, lots of prayers. And we just want to just say thank you to everybody. And even our meal that's prepared today, it's friends and family. And we just want to thank everybody for being with us. And, and uh, we really, really appreciate it. Before I jump into anything else, I do, I, because I'm going to say a lot of things that are going to celebrate Bonnie, but I really also want to just say, Dad, you did a great job. I tried to cry a lot before I got here so I could get it all out of my system because I'm like, I really got to keep this together. I lost a lot of sleep last night going, how am I going to do all this? All right. But dad, you've set a high standard of the vows that you made. And when you said for better and for worse and for richer and for poor, you meant it. And There were many times even I'd be driving because often after school I'd pick up my boys and that would be a good time. We would go right then to see their grandmother and, and, uh, you know, and, and really they would go so easily. They missed because Dad and Bonnie were living with us and had been over the last number of years and really, wow, there's just, there's just so much uh, good things that happened in that. And uh, so often, though, I'd be taking my boys there, and, and I'd be like, listen, watch, be aware, see what Poppy's doing, <laughs> and be aware of what we're doing. Someday you're going to have to do it for me. <laughs> I want you to understand, and, and do, do what Poppy's doing. Poppy's caring. Poppy's loving. And so, Dad, you surrounded Bonnie with love and care, and we all saw it. And we are inspired by it. And so, and we're better for it. And so I just want to say thank you for doing that. It made things better, way better, way better for Bonnie. So, you know, it's difficult to know where to start. Um, but it seems like everything started at Camp Evangeline. Um, family camp, 1987. <laughs> Dave and I were standing in the line to go into the cafeteria, as you often did for your meals, and there was a woman I noticed off to the side. And Dad came up, and he said to Dave and I, we're going to go grab lunch off the campground. And of course, you never turn that down, because who knows what you're going to eat in the cafeteria. So <clears throat> anyways, no shame on anybody. Oh, never mind. Just making trouble for myself. All right. So we're going to go get lunch off the campgrounds, and all of a sudden, we go and get in the car, and there are four of us in the car. Dad, Dave, myself, and Bonnie. And we drove over to the Irving Big Stop, where all new relationships are discussed, obviously. (laughs) And over lunch, Dad and Bonnie told us that they were dating. I remember Dave was good with it because Bonnie had a car and he was going to be able to drive it. (laughs) We weren't the most complicated souls back then. But it was amazing. And this was the beginning of a new adventure. And this is where Bonnie stepped into our lives. It's nice to hear how it was all unfolding, even the the conversations of her siblings. It's, It's amazing. You know, within a couple weeks of that, though, I was headed to Ontario with Bonnie where I spent a month here with her. Now, if that didn't deter her, nothing would, okay? It was a crash course into the family that she was gonna be inheriting, and it didn't. So she took me to all the sites in the the GTA. We went to the CN Tower, we went to Castle Loma, Niagara Falls, the Science Center, Canada's Wonderland, because Bonnie was just about having fun, seriously. She made my dad look like he was in the slow lane. Literally, like, (laughs) I even still blame my lead foot on Bonnie. (laughs) Dad's one of those guys, you know, he's going 50, he sees the police, he hits the brakes. (laughs) Bonnie's never driven 50. She doesn't even know what that's like. (laughs) Like, 
it just, and well, and neither have any of us since. So anyway, so she took, us, took me to all these places here in Ontario, and, and uh, I remember we went to Canada's Wonderland, and she loved to go on the rides. And, you know, so she, we were on this one roller coaster. We were sort of working our way up, right? And we started with some of the lighter ones, and then we started to get into the real business, okay? And I remember we get on this one roller coaster, and she is just howling, screaming. I could just hear it. She's like, woo, woo, just like this. It's the only way. But the thing was, so she's just screaming and yelling. And in her mind, we have discussed this many times since, she's like, I heard some woman uncontrollably screaming, (laughs) only to realize it was myself. (laughs) Well, we, (laughs) we've gotten a good laugh about that story a lot of times. So she'd tell it, and it was the truth. She screamed like, anyways, that was just the way she was. She enjoyed things. She loved to have fun, always up for adventure. Even when she's not been well, (laughs) She still wanted to go places, and I'm so glad we still took her places. We took her to Cuba when she wasn't well. It was one of the most amazing, amazing things. You know, we we still, and you know, there'd be times she would just want to go somewhere. She'd just want to go see somebody, and you know, and she would muster up the strength, and she would do it, and you know what? She usually would pay for it for a couple days, but she never had any regrets. She was just that way. So here we are, though. 30 years ago, it was that summer of love, and Dad and Bonnie decided to tie the knot, and they became newlyweds. (laughs) They obviously missed the memo that that newlywed stuff wears off, because it didn't for 30 years. And I have to admit, at times, I would be just like, ew. (laughs) Just stop already, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) But you know what, (laughs) I can honestly say I'm glad they didn't. They've had an amazing marriage full of love and the rest of us lived under the blessing of that, Uh, just in the life that that created and it has been absolutely great. She was her own woman. She wasn't afraid to be herself. I'm gonna get Mike to put up a picture here. This is a trip that I wasn't on. Our wives all went away. <laughs> and this is what happens when the men aren't around. Okay, just wanna say, anyways. But I remember one summer, I was, I, I was either 17 or 18, and you know, I was pretty happy. I was gonna be able to be a counselor at Camp Evangeline. I was gonna be a kid's camp counselor. And anyways, it was coming close to the time of camp, and uh, they didn't have enough counselors. And so just the way that Bonnie was, she's like, she's going to be a counselor, right? And so here she was, and I'm telling you, she ran a tight ship, and she had led the most energetic group at camp that year. But every day, in the afternoon, you know, when they would be playing all the games, often you'd be getting soaked. So many of the games would always involve water, and my mom was walking, I don't, I can't, how old was she? Anyways, it doesn't even matter. She wore a bathing suit everywhere. I was mortified. (laughs) I just remember I'd come across my team. I'd be bringing my team. I'm like, oh, there's my mother. Just, just, I can't explain it. I don't know what's happening there. (laughs) She she, She just was living the way that she wanted. She was herself. She was secure. And, uh. You know, you never had to wonder when Bonnie was in the crowd. I still have memories of Dad and Bonnie coming to my hockey games in high school. Oh, dear. Dad and Bonnie in full-body snowsuits. Dad's gray. Bonnie's this light blue. Listen, it's still a scandal in our family. I don't know what happened to those snowsuits, but somebody did me a favor. It wasn't me. I still, (laughs) I am not going to admit it here because it was not me, but it was the mercy of the Lord that uh, they disappeared, all right? But so here, you just got to picture this. You know, you're trying to be cool. You're, you're whatever. You're 16, you're 17, and, and your parents show up like that, and Bonnie never knew how to go anywhere quietly, 
And I mean, she would cheer me on. She would, it was like the whole arena would have a play-by-play announcement of everything I either did right or did wrong. And, and, and you know, and you're just like, anyways, this was the way she was. So all in, all the time. And uh, it's just been, it's just been grace. It really, really has been awesome. So when I, when I look back, Bonnie came right in the middle of my life, as it were. I'm sure that she was aware that I was a little boy. I was 13 when my mom, Doreen, had passed away unexpectedly. And, and I'm sure, because she knew what she, the challenge that she was finding herself in, but she really did take it in stride. She didn't force her way in. She was just her. Loving, kind, sure, stable, consistent. And it has been as normal and natural as it could be. I've had two amazing moms in this life. And for the last 30 years, it has been Bonnie Ruth Soller. Bon Bon, as I have called her. I've never liked telling people that Bonnie was my stepmom. That term speaks of a level removed to me, and that's never how I viewed her. I was her son by choice, and she never ever once told me she regretted it, or even that I'd even ever made her wonder (laughs) what she had gotten herself into. And let's be honest, Dave and I gave our parents a good run for their money. She was the real deal. And today, a big part of who I am is a result of her investment in me. A couple of months ago on my birthday, I I really experienced an amazing gift. Often I would go to the hospital late at night, just us trying as a family, trying to break things up, and, and I don't mind staying up late at night. And also, I would often try to find those would be moments just with what was happening with her liver messing up her days and nights. Often, if you were going to have a conversation with her, you could have it at night, not during the day. But uh, she had definitely been very, very low for a number of weeks. And, and I knew the, the hospital staff were, they were trying to make us aware and tell us how, you know, difficult of a place that she was in. And we were, we were aware of that. And, uh, and I remember it was the night of my birthday and it was just good. It was a Friday night. So I decided I was going to stay all night with her because, I, to be honest, I was concerned about her passing and one of us not being there the moment that it happened. And so she had been quite confused and the nurses had said to me, you know, don't, don't let her get out of bed and she's, she's confused, she's not, you know, anyways, all of that stuff. And so I went to sleep and she slept most of the night, but around 5, 5 a.m. in the morning, she began to stir, and, you know, she started to talk to me, and, and she's like, Tony, get, there's a nice chair there. And she's like, Tony, can you get me up and put me in the chair? And I must have just, you know, Bonnie always rode the edge. I was like, I don't care what the nurses say. <laughs> what can it hurt? That's what I was like, what, what can it hurt at this point? And so... I went over and I helped her get up out of bed and to sit in that chair. And I remember I sat her down and what was amazing about that moment, and I, I sent a picture to my dad about 5.30 in the morning and just give me one second. I just remember her looking straight at me. And it was the first time I hadn't seen that familiar cloud sort of in the back of her eyes. And she looked at me, and it was awesome. She looked at me, and she's like, I see you. And I looked right back at her, and I'm like, I see you too. Like, it was be a beginning moment of clarity that lasted a number of weeks that we hadn't experienced for months. Actually, probably a year. And 
because of that, it created opportunity to finish a lot of conversations. It created opportunity that we could talk about what's next and we could prepare and, and felt like it was a conversation we were all having. For a long time, I felt like we were just having conversations for her. And it was nice that for a window of opportunity, and it was a great gift, it literally started that night and it lasted a number of weeks, probably a month, and it was absolutely, absolutely amazing. So I'm gonna move out of sun mode and move maybe, I guess, a little bit into pastor. You see, I know that I could see her and I, if I could just tell you how I saw her as a whole, just three simple things. Number one, when I think of my mom and I think of the people, the person that we know, number one, she loved God. Just like scripture said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And then it goes on, love your neighbor as yourself. I just wanna just break down these two things. First of all, she loved God and all things related to that. She loved to teach about him. She loved the church. She loved being the church to everyone she encountered. It literally was tied into her identity. Jesus matters in every part of life. She lived that out every day. That was her calling. That was her assignment. It didn't matter what role she was in, whether it was being a wife, it was a pastor's wife, it was a mom, it was a friend, it was a school teacher, it was a missionary. She was in the business of Christ all her life. She loved the Lord. So number one, number two, she loved people. Love your neighbor as yourself, as God says in his word. And it did not matter who you were. She was about investing. She was about opening her home, praying people through the difficult situations. Believing in people who had stopped believing in themselves was her forte. Oh, we had a numbers of them live in our house, numbers of them that call her mom. I probably, Shelly, that's in the Maritimes, is probably watching this. She calls my mom her mom <laughs> because my mom invested in her. And I can think of other people. I can think of coming home one summer from Bible college and there being no room left in the inn and the son stayed in a tent trailer in the backyard. <laughs> this is not untrue. This is true. But I loved staying in the tent trailer. It was fine. It felt like I was at Camp Evangeline all summer long. But anyways, an aside, our house was filled with people, often people that, you know, were finding their way, and my parents would come along the, alongside of them, and Bonnie was just steady. She was able to, she was secure in who she was, and so she could speak into your life. She wasn't, yeah, they may not like that I will tell them the truth, or they may not like that she would just be steady, loving, compassionate, and help walk with people. It didn't matter... It didn't matter if you were a doctor. It didn't matter if you were homeless or where you landed in there. She would be there for you. She loved people. And I've been one of the major recipients of her daring heart. But I know that I am far from the only one. And uh, her life was open. Her time was available. She was on assignment, an agent of godly love and compassion wherever she found herself. So one last thing. When I read the stories in Hebrews chapter 11, and Hebrews chapter 11 is a chapter about people of faith and what was accomplished by faith. Now, if I can just read to you a couple verses there, because it's talking, you see this great list of all the people that we're familiar with in God's word, like all the stories, Abraham, Moses, I, you just see all, what they accomplished by faith. And some lesser named people that we don't know as well, and some great, anyways, all of this. And this is what it says at verse 13. It says, all of these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they are longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. When I think of Bonnie Ruth Soller, Bonnie Ruth Raymer, 
when I think of her and I think about her life and probably one of the biggest things that I believe she deposited in my life was a constant belief that God was up and wanted to do greater things in each one of us. It was an uncompromising belief that she had. Sometimes I would just think, she is a crazy dreamer. I can't believe she's believing for that. She's believing for this. Like, but it was just wired right into who she was. She was always believing for something more. We needed to live in expectation that God was up to something. This is the way that she lived. She was expecting breakthroughs and miracles, expecting growth, expecting supernatural provision. And as I said, sometimes I would think she was crazy, but God had implanted this supernatural hope in her. And, you know, all her efforts and her time were aligned to it. Not everything turned out how she wanted, but it didn't change her position. She lived in a position of faith. God is good. He has been. He is today, he will be tomorrow. And I believe that that truth and that faith carried her even in these last couple, couple years and especially in these last couple days. And I know that this belief is godly and it is an example worth following. As scripture says, God is not ashamed to be called her God and he has prepared a place for her. She has already arrived, she is already there. And I just want to just say to all of us today, how Bonnie lived was not a mystery. We can all follow the same road, the same route. Love God, love people, and believe on God for the assignment that he, he has laid out a plan for each one of us. God has purpose for each one of us. It says in his word that before the days of your life, he knows all your days and they are ordained in his book. N no one's a mistake, no one's a flaw, no one's some anomaly that's, to be, nothing like that. God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us and all of us, we have this opportunity and I wanna encourage you that you would live and do what Bonnie did. I actually don't, you know, yes of course, do what Jesus did but even like Paul said, Paul said to those that were following him, and he was writing scripture to, he was saying, follow me as I follow Christ. He was an example worth following. And I just say that today about Bonnie and my mom. She was an example worth following. And I would be remiss if I didn't say, hey, start that relationship today. I know what my mom would say. <laughs> She's like, Tony, you're not gonna speak at my service and not tell people what the answer is. <laughs> she was a teacher. <laughs> she was leading people, directing people towards the answer, and she spoke God's word with authority. And I don't know where everyone's at, where your life is at, but I know how things end well, and they end well in Christ. And I know how things end in life, okay? Not this life, I mean eternal life. And I know how we discover, and why today we live with great hope? Because I believe that God's word is true. And he has a word for all of us today that he is waiting, that he loves us, and he is holding life for here now and eternity for us in the future. It's all sure. It's not, I wonder, it's all sure. And I want to encourage you. Starting a relationship with Jesus is as simple as just inviting him in. Saying, God, I soften my heart towards you. And so I, I, I cannot encourage you enough on Bonnie's behalf, on my mom's behalf, for everything that her life meant and was and, and is, that you would follow the example that she said as well, a life well lived. And you know what? We will say the same things about you at the end too. All right, let's, oh, actually, I'm not supposed to pray. Carl is supposed to pray. And then we're going to sing. Carl, why don't you come? I know you're supposed to do it after the hymn, but... I can hear Bonnie saying now, It is well. 
with my soul. I can hear, tell them it is well with my soul. The Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. Lord, we wait in hope, for you are our help and our shield. In you our hearts rejoice, for we trust in your holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you alone. For those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Lord, bless your people with hope, with peace, with comfort, knowing that right now it is well. Bonnie says it's well with my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my love that.
Aleluia. Hmm. Heaven. Heaven is sounding sweeter every day, isn't it? Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining with us today. And I just pray that the presence of God will continually be with you. We invite you, everyone, to come and join with us in the Fellowship Hall for lunch. And uh, just pray that you will continue to experience his love. And we're going to pray right now so that we can go and have some food and fellowship. And the family is going to lead the way out. And so let's pray. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for Bonnie. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So God, as we go our way now, may your peace, your love, your joy be with us. And as we have fellowship around the table, Bless the food, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.